and make sure that I did this introduction, even though you've already been introduced and people know who you are. But this is an exciting topic. It's time to not talk about what we know about the past. It's time to look to the future. And I've actually asked two of our speakers to kind of tag team on this because I think it's interesting and I'd like to get different points of view. Um, but we are now going to talk about trials and research and some evidence that we might have some options that are new. So without further ado. Thank you, Lisa. And yes, it, it is the beginning of a new era, really, because we have spent uh, 50 years describing the disease and trying to understand what the disease is about. And I think we're now in the state, moving to the stage where we're trying to actually do, to actively do something about it in a specific manner, not just taking drugs that have been developed for something else. So if you think about it, there's so many ways you can interact with a disease. And the least you can do, the very least you can do is, is make people feel better. That's why we're here. But that is only scratching the surface. This is like giving aspirin to somebody who is a, has pneumonia. But in the end, you want to find the, anti the right antibiotic to cure that pneumonia. So we still have to go through several stages. We, we have to understand how we can block progression of disease. And for example, we, do, we can do this with surgery. For example, uh, we know that myectomy does this. Then there are studies like uh, the study presented by Carolyn, which are aimed at blocking the development of the disease from the mutation to the phenotype. And that is also extremely exciting if we can do that. And of course, the, the gold standard would be to block the uh, actual consequences of the mutation rather than the beginning, upstream. What we, most of the things we do now with drugs is here, just making people feel better. We can't say we, can, we in any way interfere with the disease process long term, except that we can probably slow the progression of heart failure like we can with any other kind of heart failure with ACE inhibitors, sardines, and other drugs devised for other kinds of heart failure. Again. So all the drugs we are using now are very old and developed for other conditions. Uh, some of them have been around really for, for decades. The still good drugs, we still need them. They have a lot of indications, but they're not uh, the they ultimate goal uh, we would like to have as physicians. And if you look at the re clinical research that has been done, we have reviewed this recently, uh, we have s identified in the, literature, in, in the literature only 45 studies identified over the last, last 60 years. So that's, that, that's mean, that means properly conducted studies given the epidemiology of the disease. And that's, that means one per year, enrolling a total of 2,000 patients roughly. Uh, so it's about 35 patients per year enrolled in active research in ACM since the 50s. And as you see, the last decade hasn't done much better than the previous decade, so that numbers have stayed there, no actual rise. And any other disease you can think of, heart failure, atrial fibrillation, myocardial infarction, has seen number go up exponentially, but not HCM. And despite the fact that we are diagnosed as many more patients now because of genetic testing and increased awareness. And of course, it's not easy to do trials in this disease. The disease is not uncommon, but it is not common. It is not like myocardial infarction. Uh, and it's not a homogeneous disease. It's very easy to, to, to do trials on, on myocardial infarction because they all come virtually, uh, in the, uh, they're all, all very much alike. HCM, we have seen, and you know better than anybody else, even within the same family, you have incredible striking differences. So that the end-stage patient is not the same as the non-hypertrophic genotype positive patients, and you have all the spectrum in between. And you can't compare pears and apples. You will need to compare in trials patients that have roughly the same stage of disease. The event rate, rates are low, so uh, it's, it's hard to find endpoints for the study. There's no good clinical prospective study you can do unless you have an endpoint. And we're scratching our heads over this because what are we going to do? Do a design a mortality study or in a disease that has normal longevity? Thanks God. So are we going to design a 10 year, 15 year old uh, year study to, to find out whether a drug is effective on uh, mortality? I don't think we can do that. Uh, we can probably do this if we have many thousands of patients worldwide and we have a good network and then we can look at mortality over a two, three years span. But it takes a lot of patients. Um, and then there, has, there had been limited economic interest so that not many investments have, have been done in this disease apart from the device. Devices are expensive. 
So um, there are a number of exciting things that are happening. Um, you've heard about the SHARE registry that is uh, backed by some wonderful labs, some best world's, world's lab on uh, working on HCM. I just wanted to talk to you about our specific experience in Florence, which is just one of the several, uh, by no means the most important or the best or anything like that. It's just that I'm very fond of it because it's a nice model of how you get to understand the disease and then try to act on the specific mechanism uh, so that to make this translational, this is a very fashionable word now, translational means exactly that, from the bench to bedside. So for example, what we have done in Florence for a number of years is taking the myectomy samples, rather than check it away, we, we keep it, we use it fresh, just dissect the cells, put the cells in a special machine that will measure a number of things, force, contraction, relaxation, and even in sm single cells you can measure the action potential, so the electrical activation of the cell, and look at what's wrong in its HCM compared to normal. And in fact, several things are wrong in HCM cells. So, for example, one very interesting thing that we found is that when you talk about arrhythmi arrhythmias and genesis of arrhythmia, and everybody says, yes, you have arrhythmias because you have fibrosis and disarray and scar, but in fact, arrhythmias in HCM start within the cell. So it's not just an organ thing, it's a cellular thing. And well, for, first of all, for example, uh, some of this is really so complicated I can't understand it myself. I have to trust my physiologists. But what, what is really understandable is that the action potential, so the electrical activation of the, of the single cell in HCM is very prolonged. Everything is huge in HCM. So the time activation of the cell, as you see here, uh, this is how the currents measured across the cell are prolonged in HCM compared to normals. And this is not painless because if you have this prolonged activation of the cell, you have a lot of these uh, irregular spikes called early after depolarizations, which are arrhythmic ar phenomena. These are phenomena that can trigger ventricular arrhythmias, for example, and then you know lethal arrhythmias just because of that single mechanism. Now, the reason why this is is because several channels are up or down regulated. One in particular is called the slow sodium current. Uh, channel is overactivated, so this current is just incredibly enhanced. It's just a channel that opens up too much, <clears throat> and so the sodium fluxes across the membrane are, are exaggerated. This happens in heart failure at large, but in HCM this is particularly striking. And this is one of these a specific, a, a fairly specific mechanism for HCM. So if you can counteract that, there are chances that you can. Uh, do something good, good for the patient for several reasons. Because you, you're, you may sort of lower the arrhythmic risk, but also because the prolongation of the action potential is related to how much calcium gets into the cell. So this single mechanism is not only responsible for arrhythmias, it is also responsible for the fact that the cells don't relax very well. They, you have a contraction of the heart that stays there even during relaxation of the heart. And this leads to increased oxygen consumption, uh, ischemia, as well as diastolic dysfunction. So you see that just one single ion channel can produce three of the main consequences of HCM. Arrhythmias, diastolic dysfunction, ischemia. This is an in vitro study, so it, we, we don't really know how much this relates to in vivo to the actual patient, but it is very interesting, very intriguing, because this is a very interesting target for treatment. And it's not just giving something that has been devised for something else, this is specific for HCM. So there is a blocker of this channel, which is the, it's called ranolazine. It is actually sold, it's, such, it's, it's out there, it's an old drug. It's not, a, it's not so old, but not, not so new. It's commonly marketed for coronary disease. You can use it, you can prescribe it to patients. And we have trans tested this in vivo, just to see whether this was any good for HCM cells. Again, this is not patients, this is cells. And in fact, it's very good for these cells because what it does is it almost normalizes the action potential duration. You see that from black, you go back to red on, with the drug at, at pharmacological concentrations. And with that, you have a decrease in the abnormal spikes and the reduction of the calcium in the cells and the in improved relaxation in the muscular trabeculae from myectomy samples. So because the drug was already available, we were able to quickly design a study um, just to look at whether the drug is good for HCM patients. 
This is a safe drug. It's marketed. <coughs> so this has been designed uh, as a, it's called the Restyle ACM study. We were targeting 100 patients for enrollment. We have enrolled 80 and then stopped because the enrollment phase was very long. It was very painful. It taught us a lot about how difficult it is to design a study for a disease that has not been subjected to trials before. The lessons was learned, many lessons have been learned in terms of which patient to choose, which is patient not to choose, what sort of limitations you, you may expect, and how difficult it may be to enroll. And most centers will tell you, oh, I have a lot of patients. I have 50 patients, I can enroll 20. Well, the, the truth of the matter is, Lisa, if you want to design a trial with ACM, the ratio is about one in 50. So you will probably try enroll a patient every 50 that you have in your database. That's the real truth. Either because the patient is not uh, suitable or because he lives far away or because she has little kids, whatever. So this is the first thing. Second thing is this trial is based on exercise capacity. So the data are still not out, out yet. Of course, we just finished enrollment. We will follow patients for five months. This is the treatment phase. And then uh, what we look at is the difference between initial exercise cardiometabolic testing. So it's not just a regular exercise test. It's a uh, cardiometabolic, cardiopulmonary test, the ones you do measuring oxygen with a special mask. And it's a very good quantitative um, test telling you how well your whole organism is performing, not just the heart, but the overall balance of the, um, <clears throat> of the organism. So it's, it's accurate. Uh, and it's, what you do is you treat the patient for five months and then repeat the test in the same conditions and see whether uh, patients who are on drug have done better than those who are on the placebo, because this is, again, very important. One of the very, very few, very first uh, double-blind, randomized controlled studies performed in, 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 this, in this disease. So we, I'm hopefully going to come back with, with positive results on this, but of course we don't, we don't know results yet. Uh, and with this, it's my pleasure to leave uh, the, the podium to, to Marty Manner, who will actually tell you the, the second part of this story, which is an ongoing story. Um, and the Liberty HCM trial that is going to start soon. Okay, thanks, Jacopo. It was a very nice overview. I, you know, in the, in the, in the interest of, of time, which we are behind, um, I'm going to just be very brief uh, about this really just three slides, that's it. And what I'm going to do is just introduce to you uh, what we consider to be an exciting time uh, and opportunity. This is a study that I want to talk to you about uh, called Liberty HCM, uh, which is a study that is going to be looking at the role of a new drug it's a drug that doesn't even, it's so new it doesn't even have a name yet, uh, called GS6615. Essentially, though, it's a compound made by Gilead, pharmaceutical company, which is essentially similar to renolazine that Jacopo just talked about, but it's a much more selective and, in a sense, more powerful inhibitor of the late sodium channel. Get any more detail than that unless you want it, and we're happy to provide that for you offline here, but essentially it's a more powerful ranolazine. So it's a drug that is not necessarily developed specifically for HCM, but the properties of the drug, the way the drug works, seem to make a lot of sense applying it to HCM for the following reasons. It appears in experimental models to improve heart muscle relaxation. It improves the ability of that left ventricle, which remember is thick and stiff in some ways and doesn't fill appropriately. And pressures are increased because of that. That's a reason for symptoms. This drug appears to help improve that aspect of the disease. It also seems to have impacts on improving blood flow to the heart muscle, which I and others have alluded to previously as being also abnormal in HCM. 
It also may suppress arrhythmias, both upper and lower chamber arrhythmias. And as a result, the hope is that the drug will improve symptoms, how you feel. That's the goal. Not to necessarily uh, make one live longer, that's a much more challenging question, but the drug that makes you feel better with HCM would be a huge success, be a major impact in the disease for all the patients. Now, the, uh, I go forward? Yeah. the mouse, jeez, okay. So again, just to, I'm not going to get into any, to a lot of detail because I don't think, you know, it's that important for you here, but if you're interested, you can talk to Jacopo or myself. But again, the drug is, is, is impacting a number of different things I just alluded to, as you can see here, for ultimately the goal, of, again, of improving symptoms, improving shortness of breath, improving exercise capacity, hopefully decreasing chest pain, all together making quality of life better. Now, this is a study. It's a study, it's a drug study, again, sponsored uh, by Gilead. And I'll tell you who's involved in a minute, but essentially, you know, you don't need to worry about the details of the slide other than to tell you that this is a study that is going to be starting in both North America and in Europe for HCM in the next coming weeks to months. And the goal of the study is to show and demonstrate improvement in exercise capacity. That's our marker. That's our, what we call our endpoint. And the way we're going to measure that endpoint is through a test called an exercise VO2. You may have had that for other reasons clinically, but it's a test that essentially gives us a quantitative assessment of exercise capacity. It gives us, it generates numbers for us. Of course, quality of life measurements as well through questionnaires and other parameters on the ECHO uh, as well will be measured over about a 24-week period of time where patients will be enrolled in the study if they agree, randomized. Again, that's how studies uh, work. You are randomized to standard therapy plus the drug or standard therapy plus placebo, meaning you don't know what you're getting. Uh, so you don't know what you're getting as the patient or the investigator, but you're either getting the study drug or you're getting placebo, and you're being followed over time, ending 24 weeks in uh, here, where the baseline studies, the ECHO, the exercise study, quality of life measurements are repeated at that time so that we can get a sense of whether or not there is a real impact of the drug on improving exercise capacity. So that's essentially what we're looking for, and we're very, I think we're all very excited about it, um, since, as Jacopo laid out with Renolzine, the prior basis of this study, a lot of good, uh, a lot of good information came out of that to suggest that this could be uh, effective and make, it make a big difference. And again, you don't have this opportunity very much in HCM for the reasons Jacopo laid out. It's a tough disease to study, to perform clinical trials, new drugs or even old ones. So this is an opportunity. It's a huge opportunity to be involved in potentially providing information that will help the community, patients with this disease now and in the future. So if you're interested, we're happy to talk to you about it. Uh, this is a map demonstrating to you which HCM sites, both in North America, I thought we had Canada, but I guess it's maybe the United States only, and in Europe, many of the HCM centers uh, that you're familiar with are participating across the country. Um, again, we'd be happy to give you more detailed information on who is involved with the study if you are interested. Thank you very much.